Well, it's about 5-2, and uh, there's been some interesting news in the last uh, few weeks since I last saw you. So I thought I'd just spend a few minutes giving some comments on some of the things you may have read or looked at in the papers. It's not actually about the messenger spacecraft that's just arriving at Mercury. Uh, that I might tell you about next time if it finds anything exciting. But some of you may have seen that uh, on February the 2nd, uh, the Kepler mission uh, announced its first major results. I'd just like to say a little bit about that. Um, the idea of the Kepler mission is a space borne mission and it's observing a region of the sky near Cygnus looking for planets transiting their star, going in front of the star. You then, of course, get a little uh, drop in the brightness and from that you can actually tell the fact there's a planet there and having seen two drops, time apart, you can tell what the period is. Uh, the preliminary mission is to last three and a half years. It's observing about 10,000 stars. They hope to extend that and you'll see why later on. It's expected to find between about 50 and 60 odd, 50 and 600 odd planets somewhat similar to our own Earth with orbital periods of about a year. And it should be able to tell us the type of planets and the percentage of the various types that orbit stars in our galaxy. So when all the full results are out, we'll know far more about planetary systems than we do now. So that's the idea. A star transits in front of its... Uh, sorry, planet transits in front of its star. We get a drop in brightness. You can get some idea about how big the star is from how long the transit takes. And from two of them in succession, you can get an idea of the period. It's looking in the region, uh, just up to the right of Cygnus the Swan, towards Vega in Lyra, as you see there. And that is, in fact, the view taken by its multiple CCD arrays. wouldn't mind one of those in my camera at home. And in there, it's picked out 10,000 stars. It's observing them every 30 minutes of time. It began observations on May the 2nd, 2009. So, and this is important, it's been observing for one year and nine months, at least a couple of days ago when I wrote this. And the first five detected planets, four of them were pretty big, uh, and one of them was a bit smaller. They all have very short periods. They're called hot Jupiters in general because they're as big as Jupiter, but they're orbiting very, very close to the star. They're the size of, of them compared to Jupiter. You can see that four of them are pretty big. One is not so big. And they're very, very close to their sun. What we really want to find is an Earth-sized planet orbiting its star about once a year. Because that would be rather like our Earth. This actually is a picture of an Earth-sized, almost exactly, planet transiting its star. It's that's a photograph I took of the Venus transit in 2004. So that's the sort of thing we're looking for. And you'll see why that's not too easy just yet in a moment or two. So on February the 2nd, Kepler announced the discovery of 1,200 potential planets. Not all will be, but the majority. And that was based upon about the first six months of observations. And I worked it out exactly, with the help of my wife, who's much better than, at sums than I am, 137 days. 68 of them are potentially Earth-sized. Now, the important thing is about the length of time. Because you've obviously got to get two transits to detect the presence of a planet. Um, maybe three might be better. So you couldn't have any planet detected on that database with a period longer than 137 days. That's, I think, pretty obvious. There actually is the um, locations of their 1,200 planetary candidates. Uh, the blue ones, if you can pick those out, they're the Earth-sized ones. What is interesting, so I heard um, from a transcript of a talk given just the other day at the American Association of Advancement of Science, that there are an awful lot of Neptune-sized planets, and people weren't really expecting that. Um, so, Period, 137 days, that's all they've observed for. You've got to have at least two planets to transit to make sure you get the period. In my view, preferably three, because if you had more than one similar-sized planet, you get the planetary transits mixed up. If you were looking at our own Sun, you'd get mixed up, I suspect, between the Earth and Venus. So you can only have planets with orbital periods 
uh, there cannot be planets with orbital periods less than 137 days. That's what I'd worked out. So I was quite pleased when I managed to find this plot on the web, and it actually shows all these candidates. It's a log plot, and 100 is here. Can you see they've got them up to about 120 days? So you couldn't have any beyond here. And these are the ones that are about the size of the Earth. But because they're orbiting, you can see most of them with less than 40 days, they're going to be very close to their star. And even if the temperature was about right, which in one case it sort of was, a bit of a hoo-ha was made about it, I don't think it would be suitable for life. Because if you're very close to your star, you'll be tidily locked. One face of your star will tend to be locked towards the sun, its sun, it'll be very hot, the other face will be facing out into the depths of space, be very cold, not good for life. So we've got to wait, really, until they've had a chance to detect orbits of about a year. Those are the sizes of the planets that have been confirmed so far, and they range pretty widely. They haven't got any quite as small as the Earth yet confirmed. I think that will come in time. So, habitable Earths will orbit their sun-like stars with comparable, at comparable distances to our Earth orbiting the sun. And it turns out their periods will actually be similar to a year. If the planet was orbiting a star that was slightly less bright, it would have to be closer in. But less bright stars aren't quite so massive. And it works out that, in fact, the period would be about a year. And exactly as true, if, if a star is hotter than our sun, you'd have to be further out. Normally, that would mean, in the case of our sun, you'd go around more slowly, but that star would be more massive. You'd go around about the same. So you take at least one year of data to find planets which are similar in their distance to their star, which is a good star like our sun, and they haven't yet analysed that yet. However, you notice they've got one year and about nine months of data in hand, so they've got the data, and we just keep our fingers crossed to see what happens perhaps in the next nine months or so when they release their next set of results. So, so far, they haven't yet found a Goldilocks planet, but let's hope that before too long they will do. So now we'll go back to what we're meant to be talking about today. <laughs> OK, um, the talk's title is Hubble's Heritage. And it's really about two things. First of all, I want to tell you the story of Edwin Hubble and the great contribution he made to cosmology and astronomy in the last century. And then I want to talk a little bit about the Hubble Space Telescope, which bears his name, but then in particular about the science, some of the best science or the most interesting science it's done over the last 20 years. So let us begin. He was born in 1889. He was brought up in Wheaton, Illinois, went to the high school there. He did very well at both his studies and also was an excellent athlete. He was about six foot one at full height, very, very good at high jump. He held the Illinois High Jump Championship for several years. He gained a scholarship to the University of Chicago in 1906. While he was there, not only were his studies good, but he was really a superb athlete. Um, he excelled at sports, and this is a, a picture of him here uh, in the football team that won in, I think it was 1910, the <coughs> National uh, Universities Championship. And that's the little, little ball you can see here. 1909, actually. There we are. So he did very well. Now... They, not bef much before that, they started these wonderful things called Rhodes Scholarships, where Americans could actually come to Oxford to study. And his application was supported by a very famous man, uh, Robert Millikan, famous for the Millikan oil drop experiment, we all had to do at university, who got the Nobel Prize, and said he was a man of magnificent physique, admirable scholarship, and a worthy and lovable character. Well, that's probably true. Anyway, he had to study, I think at his father's insistence, law and Spanish. He didn't want to do that, really. And he used to sneak away to the Oxford Observatory and learn a bit about imaging because photographic observations of the sky were just coming in. So he still kept an interest in astronomy. Uh, when he came back, actually, his, his sisters were slightly surprised. A nice little description here. He was dressed in a cape, knickers, and sported a walking stick. Now, I should point out that in America, knickers are not what we call them. 
they are breeches that are tightened just below the knees. And I found this picture of him wearing a pair of knickers. Uh, he had a signet ring, and he obviously was still good at high jumping because he had a wristwatch that he'd won. So he did well there and came back. Uh, when he came back, he taught in New Albany High School for a while, maths and physics. He then went and sort of became a lawyer. We suspected his father's insistence again. He didn't like that at all. It's not at all obvious that he actually did any law at all, although when he was courting his, uh, his wife-to-be, who was the daughter of a very wealthy banker, he made great play of his um, lawyer-type abilities, which we suspect wasn't totally true. But nevertheless, he got married. So instead, he went back to Chicago to do a PhD in astronomy. Now, you can't have an observatory in the middle of Chicago, and their observatory was, in fact, about 65 miles to the northwest, uh, just beside what's called Lake Geneva, which is in Wisconsin. And there, with money from Yerkes, um, he'd actually built the tram system in Chicago, I think, they built in this enormous dome, I think this is probably the biggest dome that's ever been built for a telescope, what was, for many years, and still is, the world's largest refracting telescope, with an aperture size of 40 inches. Now, he wasn't using that telescope. He was using the telescope in the little dome, which we see there, which was a 24-inch reflector. And he was using this to take photographs of nebulae. Nebulae are things that are not sort of point-like. They're woofly. And they can be all sorts of things. And we'll see some pictures of some later on. So that was what his work was. In fact, the very first paper that he published was about what is now called Hubble's Variable Nebula, or sometimes Hubble's Cometary Nebula, because it looks a bit like a comet. And he discovered that the reflection nebula, as it's called, it's actually, this is dust scattering light from the star, changes its brightness. Just look there and here, quite quickly. We suspect now it's because there are little clouds of dust between the star and the this part here, thick clouds, which basically absorb the light, and so the light falling on the basic nebula changes with time. So that was his very first paper. Um, now, many of the, quotes nebula he saw and studied were what were then called white nebula because their colour was basically white. We now call those galaxies, and there's a picture of a couple of them from that era, M81 and M82. So he was looking at these objects. And after a couple of years or so, he produced his thesis. It was actually only 40 pages. We don't get away with 40-page theses these days. And it was called The Photographic Investigations of Faint Nebulae. He'd obviously learnt a bit about this at Oxford, which is great, and this is the work that he did. Um, basically, it wasn't a bad thesis, and he made a point that there were all sorts of these um, distant neb nebulae didn't know what they were, but he sort of began to characterise them into different types, as we shall see later. But nevertheless, that got him going. Because of this work, George Ellery Hale, who had just built the 100-inch Hooker telescope at the Mount Wilson Observatory, said, would you like to come and join me as an astronomer? And you think he would. But in fact, apparently he spent a night finishing his thesis. He had the Viva the following morning, and then immediately went and enlisted with the army and sent um, a telegram to Hale saying, regret, cannot accept your invitation, and off to the war. He was um, commissioned as a captain and rose to the rank of major in what they call the, f the field and track, whatever that is, in France. So he was there for a, a couple of years or so. But when he came back, he immediately went and joined Hale and began to use the 100-inch telescope, which was then the world's biggest optical telescope. He stayed with that observatory, which did move a bit at the end, as we shall see, for the whole of his career. Now, there was an absolutely fundamental question of the time, the early 1920s. These white nebula, were they within or beyond our own Milky Way galaxy, as we now call it. Well, on one side, there were astronomers like Harlow Shapley. He was a very highly respected astronomer, so people tended to believe what he said. He'd actually measured the size and scale 
of our Milky Way galaxy, he thought it was big enough so that these white nebulae could be within it. Also, he'd observed novae, bright explosive events in distant galaxies. And he said, if those things were very, very far away, they would have to be impossibly bright. Well, they were. They were supernovae. We didn't know that. So anyway, that was one side of the argument. Um, on the other side of the argument, we go to the Lowell Observatory. This had been set up by Percival Lowell and equipped with a 24-inch Alvin Clark refractor. They made the top telescopes of that time. And uh, he'd actually used it, Percival Lowell, to map Mars, as you may remember from some of my earlier talks. And there's a picture of Lowell at the focus of the 24-inch. But he died around 1916, and uh, someone called Vesto Slifer had actually become the director. And he had two things he was interested in. One was to try and find Planet X out beyond Neptune. And that was actually done at the Lowell Observatory later on by Clyde Dombau, who discovered Pluto there. But Vesta Slifo also did a very important piece of work. He used a telescope to image the stars, but to take their spectra. From the spectra, comparing the spectra of a galaxy with those of spectral lines here on Earth, you can tell the red shift or the blue shift. Is that object coming towards or away from our own Milky Way galaxy? And he discovered the Andromeda Nebula, the nearest giant nebula that we'll see, was coming towards us at about 300 kilometers per second. This was a vastly greater speed than any objects that had been observed that were known to be within the Milky Way. So he thought that it was probably something that's outside. So we have this big argument. What do you do? You had a dilemma. To resolve the dilemma, what you needed was a direct measurement of the distance to one of these white nebula. How could you do that? So we now have to make a little sort of um, diversion to learn how we can measure the distances of Andromeda. It starts with someone called John Goodrick, who was a British astronomer, who discovered a type of variable star in the constellation of Cepheus. It's called Delta Cepheus. It varied its brightness, brightness very regularly. Five days, eight hours, 48 minutes, like a clock. It was, in fact, a pulsating star going in and out like this. Now, complicated diagram, all you need to know is these are the types of stars. Our sun is in the middle here, type G. This is the brightness. Our sun's about here at one. But these Cepheid variables, can you see they're right at the top? They're between 1,000 and about 10 to 50,000 times as bright as our sun. That's all you need to know. That means you can see them at very great distances. So they'd be ideal things to observe in objects if they were a long way away. A lovely lady called Henrietta Leavitt was employed by Harvard University at 30 cents an hour to actually make measurements of the photographic plates that were being taken. I think she was called a computer. She actually became then the head of the stellar uh, photometry department and discovered 2,400 or so variable stars, half of those then known. Now, she wanted to observe these Cepheid variables, and she did. She saw they have this very regular variation in brightness. Different ones had different periods. You can see there's a range of them, typically 3 to 30 days. That's a sort of time scale, perhaps up to 40 days. Now, she wanted to observe them all at the same distance. Now, you can't do that in our galaxy, but she realised if you could actually observe these objects in somewhere which was a long way away and not too big, all of them would be at the same basic distance. It's like all the houses in Edinburgh, no matter where it was in Edinburgh, would be roughly the same distance from us. The error wouldn't be too great. And the obvious places to try were the Magellanic clouds. We'll see more of those later on, the large and the small. You can see they're outside our galaxy, little galaxies nearby, but all at about the same distance. Now, as many of you will know, you cannot see the Magellanic clouds from uh, North America, certainly not from here, but Harvard had actually built an observatory in Peru, and that's a nice um, engraving of it. 
And in fact, I, I was pretty impressed with how good the top of the mountain looked. Do you see that? Anyway, this was a 24-inch uh, refractor, what was used there, photographic refractor. Basically, it's a big, big camera, really. And that's what it looked like there. And that was used to take all the plates that Henrietta Leavitt actually worked with. And she discovered that the longer the period of the Cepheid variable, up to about 50 days, the brighter it was, 10,000 times or so brighter compared to the, to the sun. So if, in fact, you found the Cepheid variable with, let's say, a period of 30 days, that works out to about 10,000 times the brightness of our sun. If you saw one of those simply by observing its period, you know what it was, in a nearby, quotes, white nebulae, you could work out how far away it was. Well, the obvious place to try was to look at the nearest large white nebula. It's M31, the Andromeda Nebula, which you can see with your unaided eye if you know where to look and when. It's a dark sky. And this is a lovely picture of it taken by a friend of mine called Peter Shah from a location in Shropshire. You don't have to be on the tops of high mountains to take wonderful images. Well, it was, of course, Edwin Hubble that basically used the 100-inch telescope to survey the Andromeda galaxy, looking for a Cepheid variable. And around the 6th of October 1923, he observed what he first thought was just a variable star, an n-type variable, but then, uh, an n-type star, but then he realised it was a variable. And this is probably one of the most important images taken in the last century. So he discovered a Cepheid variable. And I was terribly pleased in some of the research I did for this lecture to actually find the uh, graph of his light curve of the Cepheid variable showing a gentle fall and a rapid brightness. He could look back at other pictures of Andromeda, find the same star and sort of work out where it would be in its, in, in its um, cycle. This he sent along with a letter to Slipher. Remember him. He thought that these objects were within our galaxy. Hubble was able to estimate, using that Cepheid variable, that M31, the Andromeda Nebula, was at about 860,000 light years away, well beyond our Milky Way galaxy, which was then thought to be about 300,000 light years across. Now, those numbers are too small. We'll see why later on. And he sent that plot with a letter to Har Harlow Shapley, and you'll be interested to hear that I found a Cepheid variable in Andromeda. Well, I won't go into all of it, but it has a period of 31.4 days. It will be about 10,000 times as bright as our sun. And that's how he worked out how far Andromeda was. And Harlow Shapley's comment was, here is the letter that destroyed my universe. Because he'd been proven wrong. He took it very, very well. He totally agreed with, with Hubble. So that was the first major discovery that Hubble made, that the universe is much, much bigger and these white nebulae, we now, of course, call them galaxies, are beyond our own. So, the universe was far larger than many thought. Now, Vesto Slive hadn't stopped there. He'd actually measured the speed of approach or recession of at least 14 galaxies by about the mid-1920s by measuring their blue and red shifts. Three nearby galaxies, Andromeda, M31, and one other, are coming towards us. They're actually part of our little local group of galaxies, and gravity is making us collapse down. Andromeda, our own galaxy, are going to merge in about five billion years' time. I'd, I'd love to be back here for that. <laughs> now, what Hubble then did, he used Cepheid variables to find the distances of those galaxies. And he made a plot. Along here is distance. That's a very big distance, and that's twice as big a very big distance. So it's just a lot of, lot, lot of distance there. And here are Slipher's measurements in recession velocity, although three of them here are coming towards us. 500 kilometres per second, 1,000. I think you can see there's a trend there that the ones that are furthest away are going away from us faster. And a few years later, they produced another plot showing more distant galaxies, I'll call them, which really does look quite straight, going up to a distance of 30 megaparsecs, which is 30,000... 32.6 thousand million light years and with speeds of uh, recession up to 20,000 kilometres per second. 
Now, what does that linear plot mean? Well, out of that came what we call Hubble's law. The velocity of recession is a constant, which is called Hubble's constant, times the distance. In fact, we actually say H0 rather than H because it's the current constant of proportionality. It has changed over time, so you could argue it's a constant, but it's a constant now. His value is just a number, don't worry about the units, 500 kilometres per second per megaparsec. So he'd got a rate of expansion of the universe. Now, what does that tell us? Well, supposing you have a very simple universe, a galaxy here, well, one object here, one here, one here, just 10 miles apart. In one hour, we make that universe expand by a factor of two. Then that would be 20 miles apart it'll have gone from 10 to 20 miles. So its average speed of recession is 10 miles an hour. But the blue one, which was 20 miles away, is now 40 miles away. In that hour, it will have gone 20 miles. So if you have an expanding universe, that is exactly what you will find. The speed of recession is proportional to the distance. So he'd shown that we lived in an expanding universe, and that basically made Einstein see that his first model of the universe I'll talk about in the final lecture basically was the biggest blunder he'd ever made in his life. Now, if you know what the rate of expansion is and you assume it's linear, you can work backwards to find out how old the universe was. And he got a value of 2,000 million years. Now, that can't be right, obviously. The solar system, we think, is about 4,500 million years old. Some stars, we think, are up to 12,000 million years old, maybe more. So what was wrong? Well, it turned out there's more than one type of Cepheid variable, and basically the calibration data he had been given, nothing wrong with what Hubble did, the data he'd been given was actually wrong, for no fault of anybody. So his distances were too low. In fact, uh, the distance was doubled, the value of H0 was halved in 1952 by someone called Walter Bard, using the big telescope we'll come across um, at Mount Palomar. Another very nice piece of work Hubble did was in 1936. He basically produced the Hubble tuning fork diagram, a classification of the galaxies from elliptical type galaxies here to spiral galaxies. This is in fact a galaxy called M33, which is not too far away from us, to what are called barred spiral galaxies, galaxies which have a bar in them. So we have two sort of branches here. In fact, our own galaxy, we now think, is a barred spiral, a type SBB. So all of those names are down to Edwin Hubble. Now, this is a lovely picture of the Mount Wilson Observatory. That's the 100-inch dome in the winter. I show it because this is Los Angeles, and that's the Pacific Ocean. What's happened to Los Angeles since Hubble first went there? It got bigger and bigger and bigger. The amount of light pollution went up and up and up. And just... I shouldn't really show this one, but look, this is a wonderful image. Uh, 2009, the Mount Wilson Observatory was almost, but not quite, consumed by fire. There was some damage, but that, in fact, was quite a critical time. We were all watching the internet to see what was, might happen. Anyway, because of the light pollution, Hale said, we won't build a bigger telescope here. We will take it elsewhere. And they went to Mount Palomar, nice height, 5,600 feet southeast of, uh, of Pasadena. And there they built two wonderful telescopes. The first smaller one is basically a 48-inch camera. And it took wonderful images of the whole sky, a survey of the heavens, which we had, all its plates at Jodrell Bank, a key tool that we used to identify radio objects that we knew the position of, but we didn't know what they were. And there is, in fact, Hubble at the guide scope of the 48-inch Smith. But then they built the Hale 200 telescope, and Hubble was deeply involved in that and had the honour, as we shall see, of taking the very first image. Russell Porter did some wonderful drawings of it. And it's a very, very beautiful telescope. It's a lovely thing to see. And there actually is Edwin Hubble at the focus. This is one of the few telescopes where you actually could sit at the prime focus and put your uh, photographic plate here and image it and whatever. And the very first image they took was of Hubble's cometary nebula. He had the honour of doing that, which is very nice. Now, sadly, 
In September 1953, he died from a cerebral thrombosis. So, just like that. At that time, astronomers could not receive the Nobel Prize. And he'd actually lobbied quite hard, so they could. I guess he thought he'd probably get it if they did. But in fact, apparently in 1953, the Nobel Prize Committee decided that astronomy could become a branch of physics. Fair enough. But had he not died, he almost certainly would have been the next recipient. But sadly, it cannot be given posthumously, so he never received the honour which I think he so richly deserved, which is a great pity. And lastly, in 2008, a very lovely stamp was made of a number of astronomers. This is the one to do with Hubble, showing him with the 200-inch telescope. That's a rather lovely picture, I think, of him. So he seriously was one of the greatest astronomers the world has ever seen. And it is very right that the Hubble Space Telescope was named after him. The story of the Hubble Space Telescope actually goes back to 1946 when Lyman Spitzer wrote a paper called Astronomical Advantages of an Extraterrestrial Observatory. It sounded good. Lovely picture from here. It was for life. I do love it, you know, when they get whoever it is they're going to photograph to cover the bo board <laughs> with undecipherable hieroglyphics. I haven't the faintest idea what any of that means. Some of you here might. But it's to make these people look clever. I, I'm, I've never been too keen about that. I think if I had a picture, I'd take 2 plus 2 equals 4 or something like that. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, in fact, it, the telescope wasn't named after him, even though he led the committee that decided what its, its specification would be. But later, the um, Spitzer, named after him, infrared telescope came along. That's done wonderful work in the infrared. So he wasn't forgotten. Two main advantages the angular resolution, the image quality, would be limited only by the size of the mirror. That's assuming you've made a very good mirror. It's got to be the right shape. Rather than, as on the Earth, the turbulence in the atmosphere, which limits what even the biggest telescope can see, unless now you're observing in the infrared. But visible light, still you're limited by the atmosphere. And secondly, a space-borne telescope could observe both in the infrared and in the ultraviolet. It could extend the window over which you could make observations. Well, eventually, the Hubble Space Telescope, as it became known, was deployed by the Discovery um, Shuttle in April 1990, many years later than they'd hoped. But in fact, even if it had gone up earlier, the software on the ground to actually control it, look after it, wasn't ready till about 1990 anyway. So it was a good thing things delayed it. Anyway, there it is. You can see... It's um, solar panels. Does that one look a bit kinked? It was. They actually found the first set of solar panels were a bit floppy. And that was the problem because it slightly upset the pointing. So they were replaced at the first so-called servicing mission. And there you see it in orbit. Now I think you get a feel of the fact it's not very high. Well, it wasn't. That's actually a rather nice image, I think, because it shows you how low, relatively speaking the space telescope was and is, about 350 miles up. Now, there is um, two minus points for that. One, can you see for quite a lot of time, if something, if the Hubble is there and something's over here, the Earth's in the way, limits your observing time at one go. But also, you haven't actually got out of the Earth's atmosphere. And the atmospheric drag would gradually make the satellite spiral in towards the Earth. And you couldn't actually predict where it would be until about a week before. So that, wasn't, that didn't help. But that wasn't really a problem because the great positive thing was that it was low enough for the shuttle to go back and do what are called servicing missions, replace bits of the shuttle that would wear out. To make it point, it uses gyros, and they only have a limited life. They had four of them. It could work with two, and on one occasion it was down to two. So the idea was you'd actually go and basically replace the things that wear out. But more important than that, you could upgrade the instruments. Now, this proved absolutely critical, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, and the idea was, obviously you've got the telescope here, but the light that came into here could be reflected into one of a number of, of instruments, which all could be taken in and out from the side, as we shall see. 
So it was a very flexible thing and it could be upgraded as time went by. When they finally got into orbit, I think their hearts must have sunk because they could not focus it. They'd hoped that the image of a star would be about one-tenth, maybe a twentieth of an arc second across. Twenty times better than a typical image on the Earth. In fact, it was worse. About 15% of the light was in the right place, instead of 86%. But the rest was spread out over an area about four arc seconds across. Worse, really, than a ground-based telescope. Something was very wrong. And in fact, the mirror had the wrong shape. Something called the null corrector that had been used to figure it had been incorrectly assembled and as a result it was actually suffering from what's called spherical aberration. It was not the shape it should have been. That was a bit of a downer. In fact, radio astronomers have had terrible images for a long time. The Merlin Array Telescope that I've been involved with at Jodrell Bank for most of my life, we had lousy images and we've developed some very clever algorithms which get us clean images, much, much better images than you could ever expect. In fact, we sent our top guy over to the Hubble Space Telescope Instrument to show them how they could clean and improve the image quality. And it, it made quite a difference, but not anything like they had originally hoped. But of course, they were able to find out what the error in the shape was. And hence, they could produce what they called a corrective optics package. Either a lens, in fact they use mirrors, to actually correct for the error in the primary mirror of the telescope. It's very like my own eyes. I'm actually quite short-sighted. Um, but if I put correct lenses in front, I can actually see very, very well indeed. It's actually quite good being very short-sighted. First of all, I can see things very close. So whenever there was problems with electronics at Jodrell, when they thought there might be a little crack in a track, it was always me that had to look at them to see. And also, if you go to parties, and I never actually wear my glasses at parties, it's like having a soft focus filter in front. <laughs> everyone, looks, everyone looks at least 10 years younger, which is great. <laughs> anyway, the point is, it was a perfectly made mirror of the wrong shape, incredibly smooth, and that was much better than a badly made mirror of the right shape. Do you get the idea? Had it been a badly made mirror, you couldn't have corrected for it. So when it was done, in fact, it was considerably better. And this basically is the before and after image taken with the camera that they had at the time. In fact, as you'll see, that's been greatly improved as time has gone by. So they pretty well fixed that. Um, as I said, the instruments had replaceable, were in replaceable bays. You could take one out, slide the next one in. And they put in a number of cameras since then. And this is the one that was in use for most of the time. Do you see how much better that was than that one? Do you get the idea? And that's just the point, that from 1987 or so up to now, the quality of the cameras we have, you know, that we use is vastly better. So that was the great thing. You could upgrade the instruments. Um, in 2002, they fitted much smaller solar panels which actually produced more power. But the key thing, I think, critically, was they were much smaller. The drag was less, which would mean that the Hubble would not fall down towards the Earth so quickly. You wouldn't necessarily have to go up to it so soon to boost it back up to the correct orbit. Now, they had planned a mission to service Hubble in 2005. But you may remember, we had the Challenger disaster so everything was put on hold. And in fact, for safety reasons, it was said that you could no longer go back to Hubble because a shuttle had to be able to get to the International Space Station if it was felt it would be harmed on re-entry because of the little heat-resistant pa uh, panels coming off. And you could not get to the Hubble Sp Space Telescope and the ISS on the same mission. That actually was overruled in 1995 and a mission was set up to go and give a final refurbishment. Because basically the outcry by almost every astronomer in the world, we did not want that telescope to stop operations. It would have packed up by now, absolutely certainly. So there was a final mission. Oh, and the good thing was it didn't go till 2009, but because of those smaller panels, it was still okay. It hadn't come down too low. 
So that's it as it looks now. They gave it a, a new uh, heat shield, which helps it a bit as well. And uh, this is, in fact, the final service emission. There won't be another one. As you know, the Hubble fleet is, is stopping quite shortly. Um, I think June is probably going to be the last flight of Atlantis, but things are being delayed a bit. It might be after that. And so now we hope, with everything top-notch, with new instruments, new batteries, new servo systems, new gyros, it should be able to last well until 2014 or even longer, which is about the time that the James Webb infrared telescope is going to go up, the next great observatory, which I learned a few months ago is being delayed by at least a year. So it's likely to be 2015 at the earliest now. So it's had a wonderful time. But the great thing, of course, it has been a discovery instrument. It's made some of the most profound discoveries over the last 20 years of any instrument that's ever been built or constructed. So I want to spend the rest of the time pretty well talking about some of what I think are the most exciting things or interesting things that Hubble has done. And the first thing is, it has really nailed the distance scale of the universe. It was what was called a Hubble key project. One of the main aims they wanted the Hubble to do. In fact, it's been helped by a couple of instances of luck, as we shall see. Now, uh, this is a lovely view of the southern sky. That's called the coal sack. The southern cross actually is there. But the important thing is that's the large and that's the small Magellanic cloud. Remember, Henrietta Leavitt studied Cepheid variables in the small Magellanic cloud, but they're there in the large one as well. If you could find the precise distance to the large Magellanic cloud, that's a marvellous stepping stone. We call it the, the cosmic distance ladder, the first step in the ladder to extend further on. And that is what Hubble has been able to do. I'm homing in to a region down here. This is called the Tarantula Nebula. It's a region where basically there's more star formation going on than anywhere else we know of. If this was in our own galaxy at the distance of the Orion Nebula, similar thing, it would cover a third of the sky. Homing in again. Notice three stars here and there's that star there. Well, in 1987, I think it was that one, it blew up. It was a supernova. The only one we've actually seen, visible to the unaided eye, for Yonks, 1604 probably. Not in our own galaxy, but in the large Magellanic Cloud. Now, often stars, before they become supernovae, blow off some of their outer envelope. And it turned out there was a shell of gas at some distance away. Not that no one knew that at the time. But of course, when the supernova blew up, a burst of ultraviolet radiation travelled outwards at the speed of light. We know that. And it finally reached the shell of gas and lit it up. This is an image that Hubble took some time later when in fact material from the supernova explosion was reaching that ring of gas. But you see, there is a ring. And the Hubble has measured the diameter of that ring quite accurately. 17.2 arc seconds, I think. But what we also know is it took 232 and a half days for the ring to light up after the supernova explosion. So can you see that's the radius of the ring in light days? Does that make fairly obvious? So you know what the diameter is. If you know the diameter of the ring as a distance, 232.5 light days, you know its angular size. Simple trigonometry. Well, it used to be O-level. I'm not sure what it is now, but anyway, it's O-level. Um, <laughs> works out how far away the large Magellanic Cloud is, 170,000 light years. And that agrees very well with other estimates, but it's, it's a lovely key basic length, a distance that we know of. Now, rather nicely, in the large Magellanic Cloud, quite recently, they have found the Cepheid Veil. Did you see that little star there, right in the middle? Which is actually orbiting another star. It's an eclipsing binary system. And if you've got one of those, you can learn an awful lot about it, the mass and everything. And this has enabled a superb calibration point to be put in what's called the Cepheid sort of calibration curve, the one that was wrong in the early days. So they now know everything you need to know really about Cepheid variables. The Hubble 
because it's outside the Earth's atmosphere, can observe these Cepheid variables at very great distances, tens of millions of light years. And here in M100, which is a, a, a galaxy about 70 million light years away, you can't see it there, but here is a star that's getting brighter, and they see it oscillating just like a Cepheid variable. Even further away is a galaxy called NGC 3021, and all those little green rings are Cepheid variables that have been observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. And that has enabled them to get a very accurate distance of that galaxy, about 92 million light years. So that's a good step. You want to go a lot further than that. And here again was a little bit of luck. Although, as far as I can tell, it was never photographed by the Hubble Space Telescope, here, in 1995, was a particular type of supernovae. And this actually just shows an image. That's the galaxy. There's a 16th magnitude star just to the left. Do you see this star here? But you can see here is a supernova, which actually is considerably brighter than the galaxy as a whole. These things outshine their galaxy, in this case, by about a factor of six or seven. So there was a supernovae. Now, this particular type is when material falls onto a thing called a white dwarf. White dwarfs can only support so much mass. When the total mass, which is gradually increasing, increases, so it gets to that level, about 1.44 solar masses, it tends to blow up. It's a bit like if you took a sphere of plutonium about that big. I think I could hold it there. I wouldn't be very happy about it, but it would be all right. If we kept on adding plutonium on the top of this, bit by bit, what would eventually happen? it would get to the critical mass, which is about that big, and it would blow up. It doesn't matter where you did that experiment, North Korea, Libya, anywhere, it would still do the same basic explosion. So white dwarfs always explode like this when they do with the same basic brightness. They have a very characteristic curve of their brightness. It's due to the radioactive decay of nickel and then cobalt. So you can actually say, well, that one really is the same type of supernova, as we have seen in that galaxy that we know. So we know how bright, we know, how, we know its distance, we know how bright these supernovae are. So if we can see one in a more distant galaxy, we can compare its distance, just using the inverse square law, with the distance, 92 million miles, light years, of that galaxy NGC, is it 3021, whatever it was. Yes, 3021. Hubble, because of its great sensitivity, has seen these supernovae in very distant galaxies. Here is one that was seen in 2005. And here are a whole set. Here are the befores, and here are the afters. And I think you can see that the brightness of the supernova certainly is probably a good bit brighter than the galaxy itself, except perhaps in that case. These are very, very distant galaxies. So the Hubble telescope has extended the distance scale out to about eight, nine, maybe slightly more, thousand million light years. So that's a fantastic job. I think this is the best thing, and you'll see how it comes up in other things. It's the best thing, I think, that Hubble has done over its lifetime. And it's taken it much of that time to do it. This was 2005. Okay. We'll come back to those observations in a minute. But first of all, let's have a look at some things closer by. Um, our solar system, and also planets. Well, when Mars gets close, it's nice to take a picture. It doesn't really do anything scientifically because there's spacecraft there. But just notice, because Mars has an elliptical orbit, its size, when it is closest, varies quite a bit. Um, sorry, and this here was the closest approach for about 60,000 years in 2003. And that's the image that Hubble took. And you can see a few things, perhaps a nice round thing there and some things here. Uh, let's have a look. Someone's kindly put some little um, signs on. This is Olympus Mons, the largest volcano we know of, certainly in the solar system. Uh, the South Polar Cap, you see some nice detail there. This is Solis Lacus. There's a valley along here called Valles Marineris, and these are three of the other actual large volcanoes, not very visible. So that was nice, but I, it doesn't really tell us very much because we have spacecraft orbiting that give us even better images. But nice to see. The best image ever taken of Mars from the Earth. 
perhaps more so. Pluto, no longer a planet, of course, it discovered two extra satellites, Nix and Hydra, here. That looks quite nice. And a very nice thing, way back in the, in the 1990s, about 95, um, the shoemakers, Eugene and Caroline, along with someone called David Levy, had discovered a very elongated comet. It looked very odd with a little telescope. The Hubble took this image. That comet had been captured by Jupiter on its way into the sun and actually got trapped in orbit around Jupiter. But then it came so close, the tidal forces of Jupiter broke it up into about 25 bits. And here are some of those bits as seen by Hubble. And there was great excitement when it was realised that those bits, when they came round again, these sort of mini comets, would actually impact on the surface. Uh, they weren't going to do it like that because it was going to take a week. That looks as though it would happen in about a matter of 10 minutes, doesn't it? But nevertheless, it would take a week. But slightly sadly, the impacts were going to be just beyond the limb this is what we could see. This is the bit that's lit up by the sun. We couldn't see where the impact site was. You can see here, they were going to be just round the back. But of course, big impacts, big explosions, produce great plumes. Think of an atom bomb. And it was thought that Hubble might be able to see them, and it did. Here is the plume of the G impact site. G was the biggest of the lumps. And uh, that's, in fact, just a close-up, I think, of that image. And it produced some wonderful pictures. In fact, that's the little plume there. And here are the scars. About an hour and a half later, the debris that had gone onto the surface came round to the front and we could see them from the ground. I never thought we'd see them with our small amateur telescopes. At the time, I had a 10-inch telescope and with some of my friends, we went out to Jodra Bank to look at Jupiter. In fact, it was the first evening of the week where it wasn't cloudy. And I was amazed when it looked as though Jupiter had got two little eyes close together at the top. And this is what I'd seen. Can you imagine that? In fact, that was, for me, I saw them up the top there. And after a bit, we saw them with all our telescopes. Um, Patrick Moore was down at her sponsor using the big telescopes there, and I rang him up, he said, it's cloudy. So, in fact, <laughs> we probably were some of the very first amateur astronomers in the world to actually see these giant spots on the surface. That was, a, you know, it's one of the nights that you just never forget. It really was quite amazing, and Hubble did a great thing. And that's, in fact, pretty much what I saw these two giant spots, not with that detail, of course, but not looking uh, too bad. Okay, um, another thing it's done quite recently, it has made the only discovery of an extrasolar planet seen visually. Some have been seen in the infrared, this is the only visual one, and it has imaged a star called Formahalt, which is not very far away, about 15 light years. Formahalt will be there, this is basically a little stop to, to cut the light out. It's called a chromograph. It cuts the light from the star. That's just scattered light that shouldn't be there. But this actually is a dust ring that actually is orbiting the star. And the question is, are there any planets that you can see? Well, you can see the odd spot. Can you see a spot there? Can you see one there? And one there. there maybe one there, but three anyway. Now, how can you tell if it's a planet or not? It could be a star, couldn't it? Either be... Probably it wouldn't be before because it's not really, it's quite close, but further away. Well, what you do is you wait some time and you take another picture. And there's the other picture. Did anybody see the planet? Good. Um, the point is, what you have to do is you have to look first at one, then the other, very quickly. It was done in what's called a blink comparator in the old days, but you can simulate that in a computer, and I've done that. Just keep watching. Do you see it moving? It's not very bright. Do you see? Look here. Do you see? It's much, much easier to see on the computer screen. So that, the other two aren't moving. So that is, in fact, the planet. And those images were taken in 2004 and 2006. And it is a little planet. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than Jupiter. But it's orbiting very far away from its star, which is really the only reason why you have a chance to see it. So that was rather fun, too. Um, it's also discovered planets towards the galactic centre. It was wanting to know, we astronomers wanted to know, are there planets near the galactic centre? Or are they just out where we are, some way out? Just to get some feel of how many planets there would be in the whole of the galaxy. Now, there's a real problem. The programme is called SWEEPS. Don't worry about what that means. 
Sagittarius window extrasolar eclipsing planet search. So you can imagine they got sweeps first. We wanted to know whether there were planets orbiting stars near the centre of the galaxy. But if you look towards the centre of the galaxy, as this image shows, you find these enormous dust clouds. It's very hard to look close to the centre of the galaxy. There's so much dust. But rather nicely, not far from the galactic centre, is that slightly bright spot there. It's, it's here. It's called Bard's window. Bard's window. He was the one I mentioned earlier on. And basically, it's a little window through the dust clouds that lets you get quite close to the centre. That's what it looks like in close-up. And that is precisely where the Hubble Space Telescope looked for one week. Now, can you see, if it's observing for one week, it can't detect planets with orbital periods longer than that. Is that fair enough? So there were going to be very, very short period planets. But in fact, it spent a week looking at 180,000 stars there in 2004. So just watch this. There is the sweeps, uh, Bada's window. It's not very clear. It's about here. We're zooming right into it. These are the stars. That's probably for real, actually. It's going to home in onto one particular star. I'll do a little bit of a simulation. Here it goes. And rather nicely, at the appropriate time, a little planet's going to come around the back. <laughs> and go in front of it. So basically, while that planet's in front, the light of the star is dimmed, and if you get two transits, you can measure the period. So here comes the second transit, which in the cases of the ones it discovered were just a few days, perhaps three days. So that's a bit speeded up. You get the idea. So it discovered 16 planets. They're all circling green there. A couple of them are interesting. They've been able to confirm them, and sweep so four, which is around there, is basically a bit smaller than, than Jupiter, uh, but in fact about four times its mass, so it's obviously got more rock in it. And this one is uh, again larger than Jupiter, but also about seven, nine times, ten times bigger, in terms of ten times more massive. So that's a sort of a rocky sort of planet rather than a gaseous one, rather interesting. So basically it showed that there are planets around and they think there are billions of planets in our, solar, in, in our Milky Way galaxy. And quickly, if a planet comes in front of a star, the light of that star shines through the planet's atmosphere. And if you're clever, you can analyse what the atmosphere is like. And in one of the first ones of these I looked at, they first of all found sodium, which looks as though it's close in. There you just get the idea of the atmosphere surrounding the planet. The light's coming through it. You can actually learn about what the um, atmosphere is like. It has a sodium planet low down, but it's also got hydrogen and other gases higher up, carbon and oxygen. So they're beginning to find atmospheres on extrasolar planets, which I think is really quite clever. Now, we're coming to the end. Dark matter and dark energy. Well, we had a whole lecture about that called the Invisible Universe, and Hubble's obviously made a contribution. Um, this is a picture, Hubble picture, of uh, a cluster called Abel 370, and those are the brightest galaxies you can see. But do you see all these little arcs and curves? Not so bright. But the point is, that's pretty bright, behind this galaxy, much further away, there's another cluster of galaxies. And its light is being distorted by the mass distribution of this cluster. It's called gravitational microlensing. It's all down to Einstein. He has an awful lot to be blamed for. Nevertheless, what that does, it enables you to find out about the amount of matter and its distribution in the foreground cluster. And it tells you there's about six or seven times more mass there than we can see. And that's this so-called dark matter. And it's been able to look at different ages in the past. And it's showing that the dark matter is becoming clumpier, which we shouldn't be too surprised about. It has gravity, has gravitational attraction. Things that do, do tend to clump. And that's proven to be and also, this is the bullet cluster, two clusters have actually collided. And the X-rays are showing where the gas is. The blue is basically where the normal matter is. That's done by Hubble. This is done by the X-ray satellites. And it shows that in this collision, the dark matter and the normal matter have actually become separated, which is apparently exactly what you would predict. So it's doing some real work. And there's one more little bit to come up later on about dark matter. It's also 
by observing distant galaxies helped us learn about what we call dark energy. Um, remember Hubble's law? We had a linear plot. Well, we always knew it would be linear down here, but as you went to great distances, you'd be looking further back in time, and the, the basically the expansion of the universe has changed with time. And it, we knew it would not be a linear plot. If you sort of make this line horizontal, it was thought that distant galaxies would be seen down here. That's what would happen if the rate of the expansion of the universe was slowing down with time, which is what we all thought it was doing. But instead, they're up here. And basically, it looks as though the universe is now expanding at an ever faster rate. More of that if you come to the final lecture in a few weeks' time. So, it appears that the expansion of the universe is increasing. We think this is the effect of what's called dark energy, it seems to be a pressure exerted by the vacuum of space and it probably comes out of something called the cosmological constant which is something that Einstein included into his equations in 1915 of the theory of general relativity. So again, it may well be down to Einstein. Um, it's done some lovely work looking at very distant galaxies to learn about galaxy formation. They're called the Hubble Deep Fields. This was the first one in the 1990s, taken in the region of Ursa Major, where there are virtually no stars or nearby galaxies or anything in the way, and you can see all these galaxies, about 10,000 galaxies are visible there. And uh, rather nicely, it was done in the north, partly so that we at Jodrell Bank could use our Merlin telescope to observe as well. We observed for about a fortnight. We can't see all those galaxies, but we saw the 16 brightest ones, and we were able to put a very, very accurate grid positional grid on the whole of that field, which has been very, very useful. And in their paper about the field, they do recognise the work that we did. As I helped build and design Merlin, I feel at least have a, a little bit to do with that, not much. Um, then they went and did one in the southern hemisphere, called Hubble Deep Field South, that actually showed that the universe over there is just the same on the large scale as the universe over there, which is what it should be. That's the cosmological principle that on the large scale, the whole of the universe should be the same. Then they took what was called a Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which we see there. Come back to that. It was a one million second exposure. The faintest galaxies visible there were giving one photon per minute. They're faint. We know from this that galaxies in the distant past were smaller and more irregular than those we see nearby. And of course, the ones we see nearby we're seeing nowish. Star formation peaked about 9,000 million years ago and the current rate of star formation is only about a tenth of what it was at its peak. So there are many, many star stars being made in the past. Um, it also showed that there are very few red dwarf stars, these are very faint stars, in the halo of our own galaxy through which it was looking. Only 20 stars were found. It was thought there might be many more of that and that red dwarfs and other things like black holes might contribute significantly to what's called dark matter. That looks as though that's not the case anymore. So that was very useful as well. And very recently, looking in detail at some of the objects in that particular Hubble Ultra Deep field, they have discovered in here, a little, can anyone see a little spot in there, a little red spot? That's the most distant object ever seen in the universe we believe we're looking at it as it was just 600 million years after the origin of the universe, one of the very first galaxies that was ever formed. So we're looking back to see the very, star, very first star formation in the universe. That would be impossible without the Hubble being able to locate those objects so accurately. So it's done some absolutely wonderful work, as I'm sure you'll agree. And just for a couple of minutes, you can do this at home. Just go into Google and put Hubble heritage images. Some of its time has been spent imaging the most beautiful objects that we have in our Milky Way and beyond. And they're in all sorts of books, including my own, and the great thing is you don't have to pay to use them. So everybody uses these wonderful images and it is a real heritage left behind or will have been left behind by Hubble. We'll just quickly look for a couple of minutes at some of these. Um, this is Jupiter. And notice it says Hubble heritage down the bottom here. Do you see the aurora? Uh, but there was a bit of a hoo-ha. Remember last week? 
And I, got, I had to do some, some uh, local radio, national radio about that. Um, and in fact, there are instruments that tell you whether there's like to be an aurora, and they're all saying there wasn't. So I was being a bit of a, a party pooper. But the thing that no one on the main telly said, there was a full moon. If there's a full moon, you haven't really got any chance at all. I said that. Wasn't I wrong? <laughs> but anyway, it was cloudy. But anyway, there's aurora on Jupiter. Um, some lovely pictures you've seen before of Saturn showing the various phases of the rings as it goes in its orbit. And this is rather lovely. Uh, I didn't know it was one. That's, um, one of the, that's Titan, in fact. And here are two planets. Do you see the little shadows? That's 2009. That's not very long ago. And then we have these things called planetary nebulae. They're what happens when stars like our own blow up. And what's left behind is a little white dwarf, which is that. This is what's blown off. The red colour is hydrogen, but you see the turquoisey, the sort of blue and green, that's largely oxygen. So the oxygen we're breathing in this room here today were produced as stars like our sun blow up and die. And that's another one. Rather beautiful. Maybe call the cat's eye that one. I like that one. A bit like a spirograph picture, isn't it? And here, oh, that's the cat's eye one, yes. These are really beautiful. Uh, sorry, and then we can just go out to see some of the galaxies. This is called the Whirlpool Galaxy. And in fact, to do this, the Hubble had to take many images and combine them together. It only sees about that size in one go. So that's a fantastic image of a beautiful spiral galaxy. One of these so-called white nebula that was looked at, in fact, by Edwin Hubble. And here's a barred spiral, a bit like our own. In fact, the, 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 the two arms are much wider than in our case. And this is called an active galaxy. It's only 12 million light years away. But here, a massive burst of far star formation is blowing out, ah, sorry, is blowing out all this material. You can't see in there because of all the dust. But our Merlin radio telescope can look inside. And we've spotted about 30 odd supernovae actually expanding as time goes by. And this is the Sombrero Galaxy. That's obviously because it looks a bit like a castle. It's what you see when a, an easy jet comes into Liverpool and they've got one of those on their head and they've got a big donkey under their arm. <laughs> um, and another one here, another barred spiral. A little bit of a bar up here. We're nearly there. And interacting galaxies. A triplet here, ARC 274. Another one there. That's a bit like M33, a nearby galaxy to us, but much further away. And finally, it's looked out at these lovely clusters of galaxies. I've talked about those in the past. Galaxies tend to not be by themselves. This is a giant cluster, maybe a thousand galaxies. We're in a very small little group of about 50 galaxies. Quite posh, upmarket little group. And there we go. So Hubble has done wonderful things. I hope I've had a chance to tell you what some of them were. Thank you for listening. <laughs>